Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. And on behalf of my colleagues in the Events in Africa teams, I really want to welcome you to this policy forum, which we have entitled Peacekeeping in South Sudan, Lessons Learned, Opportunities, and Challenges. And I particularly want to welcome our three speakers, Ambassador Francis Deng, the permanent representative of South Sudan to the United Nations, uh, Margaret Carey from the Department of Peacekeeping Operations, and Dr. Jock Madak Jock, who is the executive director of the Sud Institute in Juba, uh, all of whom really bring great knowledge, insight, and experience to our discussion today. And your uh, program, I believe, has your their CVs. So I, I will not read out their CVs to you, but they all have very distinguished careers, and both uh, Francis and Margaret are well known to everybody here, and Dr. Chuck has written extensively. So they all bring a tremendous range of knowledge to this discussion. Well, as everybody here will recall, in January 2011, which is only three years ago, the international community was witness to the successful outcome of the referendum on the future of South Sudan without violence or fraud, and after decades of civil war between North and South, the refer referendum was hailed as a tremendous achievement, as a great success, and the independence of South Sudan was celebrated in Juba with the participation of the Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and a wide range of international dignitaries. And you'll also recall that for the preceding six years before that, there had been considerable trepidation that the referendum <clears throat> agreed upon by the Comprehensive Peace Agreement of 2005 would be <clears throat> blocked or thwarted by the Sudanese government. Uh, and that finally did not happen. In retrospect, thinking about today, it would seem that very few of us anticipated that the establishment of South Sudan as the United Nations 194th state would quickly lead to a new internal conflict. I mean, how many of you thought that was coming three years ago? Between competing political or ethnic forces in another fragile developing African country. So last December 15, just two months ago, just two months ago, a power struggle within the government erupted, uh, reportedly a competition between the President Salva Kiir and Vice President Riek Machal, and it erupted into mass violence. Over the past two months, thousands, maybe tens of thousands of people have been killed, wounded, displaced, turned into refugees or IDPs. And a huge humanitarian as well as political crisis has confronted the United Nations. Its peacekeeping mission in the field, UNMIS, senior officials at UN headquarters, the UN Security Council, and the humanitarian agencies have again been forced to respond to the crisis and its consequences. So, you know, once again, as in Rwanda 20 years ago, and also in the Central African Republic today, I think we can ask, was all this totally unexpected? Was there a prevention strategy? Where was the Security Council? Where was EGAD? Where was UNMIS? And above all, where was the South Sudanese leadership? In other words, how has this happened? Uh, thinking about all the preceding efforts to prevent conflict and address them before they explode. So it's widely acknowledged that there's no military solution to this conflict, and that only a peaceful political solution can end the crisis. <clears throat> to that end, the January 23 ceasefire, that's something like three weeks ago, has been hailed as a critical first step toward building lasting peace. But of course, it's only the beginning of a much longer process to resolve the underlying causes of the conflict to foster reconciliation and ensure accountability for the massive human rights abuses committed against the South Sudanese people. So I think we can also ask, does the UN have a peace building strategy? 
over and above achieving the immediate cessation of hostilities. Uh, political talks have begun on February 11, uh, that's literally uh, two weeks ago, intended to focus on the root causes <laughs> of the conflict and seek ways to achieve political dialogue and national con reconciliation. And South Sudan faces other major challenges, including inadequate governance, many people believe there's corruption, the failure of political and military leadership, at least to avert these crises, this crisis, as well as confronting the issues of justice, accountability, and reconciliation among deeply divided communities. All these words must resonate with everybody in this room. This is what you all work on all the time. So I've asked each of our three speakers to provide their perspectives on these important and I think deeply troubling issues. And each will speak for 10 minutes. Thereafter, we'll have a Q&A session. And in order to give everybody here as much time as possible to participate, I really want to ask you to refrain from making speeches or statements and to instead to ask direct questions of the speakers. And also, before we start, turn off your cell phones so that we can really hear what they have to say. So again, it's great to have you here. It's wonderful to have the panel here. And I'd like to turn the floor over first to Ambassador Deng. Yes. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, it's a tremendous attendance, and I wish the occasion was a happier one. Uh, but all the same, we appreciate the interest you have. Um, uh, let me begin by expressing my appreciation to the Institute and to you, John, for organizing this meeting at this critical juncture of developments in our country. Uh, superficially, uh, one looks at what's happening and say it's very simple. Violence broke, up, uh, broke out in, on the 15th and 16th of December and then escalated on into massive rebellion. Very simple. But a closer look would reveal that uh, is a situation of greater complexity than that. Um, what I thought I would do is talk to you about the meeting we had recently in Juba of all the ambassadors uh, to be briefed by the government about the situation. I will leave the more analytical approach to my fellow uh, panelists, and particularly Joke, who has already done quite remarkable work in analyzing the situation. The briefing was conducted by a number of ministers, uh, including foreign affairs, defense, justice, interior, petroleum, finance, education, uh, cabinet affairs, and crowned by the vice president and the president. A number of themes uh, were presented, and the main ones I'll just mention very briefly here. The main one was, uh, actually echoed by all the ministers, and was focused on characterizing what happened on the 15th and 16th as an attempted coup uh, that had been well planned and coordinated initially, erupting among the presidential guards and swiftly spreading to other military formations in Juba and in three other states. A relevant theme was a more legalistic analysis by the Minister of Justice, building on the fact that a crime had been of, uh, committed, that is the crime of treason, and what needed to be done in response, mostly focused on the kind of punishment and procedures for effecting it. But to me personally, the most informative was the approach adopted by the Vice President and the President, which saw the problem uh, as a process uh, while upholding the argument or the theme of uh, an attempted coup, they traced the political conflict back to the meeting of uh, the Politburo uh, in March, and then a number of specific episodes of confrontation between the president and some of the senior colleagues, in particular, Vyagmashar, the former uh, vice president. And of course, that culminated in the end in his massive dismissal of the cabinet and reconstitution of a new cabinet, including dismissing the vice president. A point that was repeated by most speakers 
was that the conflict was not between the Dinka and the Nuer, in, in other words, an ethnic conflict, as is being uh, claimed by many, uh, particularly because there are the two groups are found on both sides of the conflict, and therefore it is not necessarily see it should not be seen as an ethnic conflict. And then there was, of course, the issue of the release of the detainees, uh, which also drew considerable contentious attention. And a number of ministers spoke also about the impact of the conflict on their work, on their uh, the work of their ministries. And uh, these were mostly uh, ministers of petroleum, finance, and education, as well as cabinet affairs too. The implications of the conflict for South Sudan's relations with the international community also figured very significantly, and particularly because uh, uh, popular reaction was, uh, uh, I mean, focused on the UN and, and the special representative of the Secretary General, uh, which for some reason people saw as somewhat partial to one group. Now, depending on the perspective adopted in these presentations, uh, the, the response called for would follow accordingly. For instance, focusing on the premise of a coup, a coup attempt uh, would mean responding with criminal prosecution and other pertinent procedures uh, emanating from that, which was indeed the approach adopted by the Minister of Justice uh, and still is the approach he is adopting. The broader process approach uh, adopted by the Vice President and the President uh, would be, would tend, to me, would tend to go beyond the criminal dimension to involve political considerations and measures to restore peace, unity, and reconciliation. And those indeed are the themes the President highlighted in the briefings. Now, the controversy over whether this was, is an ethnic conflict or not, uh, while initially it was not necessarily ethnic, but the targeting of groups in Juba and later on in other areas of the conflict turned it into an ethnic conflict, even though uh, people believe the root causes are not purely ethnic, but <laughs> politically. Uh, the issue of the detainees, of course, raised questions on whether they should be referred to even as political detainees or as suspects. And of course, the significance of that is uh, if you call them political detainees, the emphasis would be on the political dimension of the conflict. But if they're seen as suspects or accused, then the criminal element uh, features significantly. Um, of course, a number of ministers spoke about the impact this conflict is having in quite a number of areas. The level of destruction to life and property uh, is quite uh, self-evident, but was also elaborated upon by a number of the ministers who spoke. The area of the impact on South Sudan's relations uh, with the international community uh, also featured very significantly. I was particularly moved by the fact that, as I always do, I would go and see the special representative of the Secretary General. And so when I went to see her, I was directed not to her office and not to her house, very nice place, very nice office too, but to the military compound. Because of fear, of the situation, she and her senior colleagues had moved to the compound for protection. And they made it clear to me that their fear was not the government doing them any harm, uh, but the fact that the climate international, I mean, uh, uh, nationally had been so charged and allegations of partisan sympathies to the rebels so, um, electrifying that you had demonstrations with uh, banners against the UN and, and also against the, uh, against the Special Representative of the Secretary General. Uh, in a way, uh, it was 
as we con continue the discussions, it became clear that uh, given the role the United Nations had played uh, in helping the South attain independence and the massive support, the goodwill, and I was on the other side, so I saw the extent to which the Secretary General was very committed. Unmis was the translation or combination of this strong support for South Sudan. And therefore, while there may be concerns and misunderstandings or complaints on both sides, which uh, we might hear more about later, the fact of the matter is that South Sudan cannot afford to lose the United Nations cooperation with the United Nations. And so all of us agreed that uh, notwithstanding the popular sentiment, we have to work to remedy uh, the misunderstandings and to work constructively with the UN in order to address the concerns. Um, indeed, after my visit to uh, the Special Representative, Secretary General, and coming to report to my colleagues who did not know that they had moved to military camp. Uh, we moved very quickly uh, with the minister making a very strong statement, followed by the president making a statement, and followed by the uh, president meeting with Hilda Johnson to assure her and her staff, and to also make statements to remedy uh, that perception. Um, Did the crisis come as a surprise? Yes, to a large extent it came as a surprise, but many would say that it was somewhat predictable. In fact, the process leading to the independence of the South uh, was not a smooth one. I mean, there was a great deal of skepticism about South Sudan becoming uh, a viable state, as an independent state. Uh, I won't get into rehashing the whole process again. Uh, but it was mostly focused on the fact that this is a country of immense diversity and that as soon as uh, uh, the South becomes independent and the element of conflict with the North is removed, uh, they will get into ethnic conflicts that could easily tear the country apart. Um, well, six years of interim period and two years of independence proved that those predictors of doom, those prophets of doom, were wrong. And some of us kept saying, we should not just pat ourselves the back and say we have proven them wrong. We should prove them wrong every day. But after six years of uh, interim period and two years of independence, I think many people were becoming a bit too complacent uh, that the South was succeeding. And some of us also believed that half a century of warfare had so militarized society that the temptation to resort to easy violence in dealing with conflicts was still there. And it accounted also for the amount of uh, violence that was still rampant and violations of human rights and, and the situation of insecurity that prevailed. Uh, nonetheless, it came as a surprise, as I said, because we thought we were succeeding in the broad sense of the word. I believe that the response of EGAT subcommittee, the AU, the UN, and international community generally is proving to be constructive in containing the situation. And I think every time we have a crisis, uh, the international community does not live up to saying never again, but it does better to try to contain situations. And I think quite a number of conflicts recently have witnessed the response of the international community to remedy the situation. And so the peace process that's going on now, uh, as well, not only with these institutions, but even by individual countries, I think are promising signs of cooperation. Uh, we can say that in crisis, there are always opportunities. And the opportunities that one can say may exist in this situation is the South had become a bit too complacent with itself. And now the crisis is challenging them to look back at what happened, why it happened, what were we doing wrong? And again, as I said, Joke has written quite a bit about this and might have something to say. The irony is that the president's desire to promote unity led him to uh, offer amnesty 
and pardon many uh, militia groups so that in the end, their incorporation into the army resulted into what is now 75% of former militias are part of uh, today's army and many of them, most of them are overwhelmingly newer and many of them have now joined REAC. Uh, again, there is a lesson here to be learned because the president is still talking about restoring peace, unity and reconciliation. Uh, and the priorities for him are precisely that, that we must stop the bloodshed, we might provide humanitarian relief, address the issue of these people who are being detained and uh, in accordance with the law and negotiating a resolution that will get us back to restoring peace, unity and national reconciliation. The challenge now is where the talks will lead in terms of the substantive outcome and the formula that can restore and sustain unity and reconciliation, especially because in the minds of many, this is a replay of what happened in 1991, led by Riyag Mashar himself when he attempted a coup against the leaders of the SPLM. And so there's an urgent need to address the challenges of the country made vulnerable by a 50-year war, and now made even more vulnerable by this conflict. And so what we call for is really sympathy, understanding, and support from the international community. There are elements where the South uh, Sudan can be uh, scrutinized and criticized, uh, but I do think that uh, all things considered, what this country has gone through calls for increased sympathy and attention to the needs of the people and the pressing need for restoring peace, unity, and reconciliation. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very, very much, Francis. Of course, you're twice invoking a half century of conflict as an underlying factor in this breaking out again. So it should get us all to think about, you know, what is prevention, the question I've asked uh, at the beginning of my own remarks. So we're now going to hear from Dr. Jock, who has spent uh, his career studying the political uh, and social dynamics in Sudan and South Sudan. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for inviting me. And thanks, all of you, for giving up your afternoon to come and uh, converse with us on the issues of South Sudan. Um, as the Ambassador has uh, pointed out, uh, the events of December 15th, 2013, that brought the country to a near collapse were extremely shocking, uh, but they were not surprising by any means, at least to people who have watched uh, this country over the last nine years. It was only a matter of time before the country returns to these kinds of situation. Uh, it has been long in the making what happened in December. Uh, in fact, it had been, South Sudan had been at war almost on a daily basis. If, you, if we are being honest about the, the local dynamics there, the violence that so many people had been living in, in Upper Nile, uh, in Greater Bahar Ghazal, uh, you may call it cutter rustling or uh, ethnic feuds, but the fact is that people continue to live in violence, even in times of supposed peace. Um, the level of deprivation um, of the majority of uh, people and exclusion from the gains of independence uh, matched against the hopes and aspirations uh, brought by independence was something that was bound to cause uh, some form of unrest. Uh, we just didn't know what form it was going to take. Was it going to be a kind of popular uprising, the North African style? Was it going to be um, mass protest on Juba streets, was it going to be a coup or a, uh, something like this? We just didn't know what, what form it was going to take, but that this was going to happen was only a matter of time. Um, the speed at which the violence spread out of Juba and to so many areas was a clear sign that there was more to the political climate in the country than just a reaction uh, to the Juba events. Uh, it was related 
to the economic policies of the country or lack thereof. Here you have a population with 73% of them below the age of 30, a majority of them completely excluded from what you might call a gain from independ by, of independence. Um, uh, people who have spent uh, an entire generation who has never had a chance to, to invest in, in itself, uh, who have very little to hope for, to live for, um, was only a matter of time before they expressed that deprivation and exclusion in one form or another. What happened in Juba was just a trigger, uh, but it was not uh, an, an, an independent event on its own. Uh, the security structures and programs, uh, what Ambassador Deng was referring to as reconciliation and peace building, uh, buying of stability by the president, by, by uh, inviting all the various militias uh, to join the SPLA have led to uh, a creation of a monstrous institution, the biggest institution in the country, the most expensive to run, the most difficult to, to, to rule, um, means that uh, it plays the country in a dilemma. On the one hand, if you don't invite all the militias to come in, you will not get peace. But if you invite them in in a haphazard manner, the way it was done, then you have actually uh, created an unwieldy institution where members of that institution don't have any, any shared culture or ethos that they all subscribe to. Very difficult to command. In fact, the war in Juba, the, the battles that took place in Juba, happened without commanding officers. The soldiers went and fought every day, and if they get tired, they go home, and then come back again another time. There, were no, there, were, there was no way to, there was no structured system for the army to be, to be, to be, uh, to be a, a professional army. Um, now we are here, um, 10,000 dead, uh, million people displaced, and the numbers are increasing by the day. The economy basically brought to its knees, and the social fabric and ethnic relations uh, wrecked, destroyed, or at least brought to the worst that they have ever been in the history of South Sudan. The issue of politicization of ethnic relations. There's one stream of conflict that has always recurred in South Sudan, and that is where political figures vie for public office, but then when they cannot get it through the more uh, civil democratic means, they reach for the ethnic card and make their quest for public office a question of survival for their entire tribe. This um, has been uh, something that was bound to, to create the kind of situation we are looking at today. Um, so uh, the peace talks, um, um, I mean, they, what do we do uh, looking uh, towards uh, the future uh, of this country? Um, the, the peace talks that are taking place in, in, in Ethiopia, um, I think they can best be looked at uh, from the comparative point of, uh, of view to the CPA, the peace agreement that brought uh, the North-South war to a relative end. Um, the same dilemmas that the CPA mediators and negotiators uh, were faced with are now being confronted once again. Um, the dilemma is that um, do you focus more on an inclusive, broad-based peace process that is currently being demanded by civil society, by uh, professional associations, by all kinds of groups. People are saying this peace agreement, this peace process has to be a lot more inclusive, not just in terms of token representation at the table, but uh, a much more meaningful representation, including the, 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 the creation of the agenda of the talks. Uh, so that the civil society is able to include what they think is the problem with the country to become part of the, uh, of the discussions. Uh, or then do you focus on the warring parties? 
uh, reducing the whole process to a business of dividing whatever anticipated peace dividends may be, a kind of a, a quest for a, a return to the old status quo, where some of these political leaders who have taken up arms may end up being rewarded with power and resources for the mayhem they have caused. Uh, this is where you are. Do you go for a more inclusive one that will take long and be more deliberate and didactic so that when whatever you achieve is something that can be can produce a, a durable peace? Or do you focus on the warring parties in the immediate sense so that you end the the fight, the, the conflict, the death that is going on at the risk of uh, coming up with a peace process that will uh, collapse once again in another year or two, the same way this one did. Um, obviously, this is a this is classic dilemma in all uh, almost all African conflicts, which are multi-layered. You have the big warring parties, you have smaller warring parties, and all the way down, you solve the big one at the top. You don't touch the root causes. You don't touch the issues of justice and reconciliation. You don't touch. Um, uh, issues to do with the more strategic restructuring of the state and the institutions of the state, because you are simply focusing on, on ending the violence once uh, or, or right away. So, um, so both sides have the risk, as you can see. If you focus on the, on 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 the warring parties, you are simply patching up, um, uh, band aid kind of approach. If you go for more inclusive, broad-based process, you might include things in that, on that agenda that might scare the warring parties away from the table. A more inclusive peace process is a very difficult one to get. Um, so is there a middle ground between these two extremes? Uh, possibly, in the case of South Sudan, I think there is a middle ground, and that is a more uh, a sequential uh, peace process where you, you focus on one thing at a time, on a chain of issues, beginning with the ceasefire, making sure that the ceasefire and cessation of hostilities that is in place now is maintained so that uh, it becomes a, a, a trust building uh, a step towards the next step, which is um, humanitarian access. People, a million people displaced. You cannot really talk peace while people are dying in such large numbers. I think the ceasefire should be something that built into it. The uh, clear, clear uh, steps about how to, to deliver humanitarian aid, denying the warring parties the opportunity to dictate where, where, where aid goes and where it doesn't. Um, Failing to do that, you are looking at OLS once again, and that's really a place where South Sudan did not, does not need to go back to. OLS, made, ma, 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 while it saved lives, it became intrinsically involved in the war, and it became a part of the war, uh, and it made for a very prolonged war, because warring parties usually relinquish their responsibility for welfare, uh, because somebody is feeding their citizens, they can just go on fighting their war. Uh, such, a, such a humanitarian response to the current situation will make the situation worse. So we have to think very carefully about uh, the humanitarian access and, and what, what regulations are. And then you go to the next step, which is the step of, political, of the political settlement, where you finally work on, on, on um, dividing um, the, the pie, as it were, between these uh, political con, uh, contenders. Um, so... Um, so the middle ground might be one where you go one step at a time and not be too ambitious to include everything uh, because a, a peace agreement, a peace process that includes everything is a very difficult one to achieve. Uh, you go for a genuine ceasefire. The problem with ceasefire in South Sudan right now is that, of course, it takes only one action, action of one person to destroy it. And we know that there are lots of people who are very, very angry with guns uh, who do not fall uh, follow either of the uh, the former vice president uh, opposition movement or the, the government. Uh, and they're simply interested in avenging the killings that happened in Juba. And so all they need to do is, 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 is uh, 
raid a place, uh, like right now, Malakal. Today, we were told uh, Malakal is under attack from the rebels. So ceasefire is very difficult to sustain. Uh, and therefore, the next step would be almost be impossible if people are still fighting. Um, uh, but all of this, um, in order, whatever peace agreement you come up with, uh, in order to, for it to be a, a, a durable one, must consider the following steps. Um, a more strategic institutional restructuring of the country and the, and the, and the systems of govern, governance, beginning with the army. The military has collapsed. There's no question about it. If you have uh, 60, 65 percent of the entire national army made up of one ethnic group, which is now joining the opposition, I don't know what, uh, what, you, you, what, what national army you can speak of. And so it might be an opportunity to restructure the military, uh, complete with basic minimum requirements about how people join the force. What, what, what are some of the minimum requirements for you to qualify as a member of the force? Uh, and on to all kinds of training, including training in, in human rights. Um, the next step is to go for a much deeper and broader reconciliation that uh, everyone will buy into. Uh, but in order for everyone to buy into any kind of reconciliation, uh, the, uh, uh, there is another uh, basic requirement in it, and that is accountability for uh, things that have already been done, um, which is extremely critical for reconciliation to succeed, uh, because the impunity of the past is a big part of the current uh, revenge and counter-revenge uh, episodes that we have seen. Uh, but all of this, if they were to be, few, to be to, if they were to to, to lead to a future stability have to be built into the peace agreement so that uh, the parties are committed to uh, not just uh, creating, uh, having a peace agreement, going back and, and running a government as if nothing has happened. They should be committed by a peace agreement that these steps need to be done. Uh, and they, they, there are mechanisms to watch them do it. Uh, IGAD might be able to, uh, African Union Security Council might be able to, to set up mechanisms for, to make sure that these commitments are, are followed through. Uh, lastly, uh, this becomes the foundation of peacekeeping. If the international community was going to intervene with the, uh, and continue the, the peacekeeping force that is already there and that has been increased uh, uh, this year in the wake of these events, then um, what we have seen with UNMIS in the, in the past few years uh, is that UNMIS, um, the UN agencies, uh, the donor uh, countries, the diplomatic missions, the government of South Sudan itself have all focused on the S word, uh, the state building, state, state. That, that if, you have, if you strengthen the state and state institutions, then the state will then turn around and, and, do, and, and does the protection. Because the peacekeeping force in South Sudan, what can it do? It, a peacekeeping force envision as to go and stand in the middle of two warring parties, but then when it goes into the ground, what, what do you get? What you get is um, incidents of rape here, incidents of cattle raiding over there. How do you maintain peace that, uh, that does not exist? There has to be peace to begin with uh, in order for you to, to enforce it. Uh, so, um, but, what, but focusing on strengthening the state has missed uh, a very, very important opportunity to look at the other side of the coin, and that is uh, nation building. And by nation building, I mean people, the citizens of South Sudan um, have to be a focus uh, so that the relationships between the various ethnic groups have to be repaired. The relations between the citizen and the state have to be built such that, uh, so that people are more, uh, have more at, uh, at stake in, this, in, the, in the nation, and they relate more to the nation than to their ethnic group. I, I, I jokingly say that South Sudan is my tribe. So if you get people to that level where they will think of themselves as citizens in South Sudan and not citizens of Nuer and Dinka and so forth, um, uh, you will still not have ability to maintain peace, um, even if you bring the entire army of the world. It would be extremely difficult for peace to be maintained in a society where everybody expresses most of their loyalty to their region or their ethnic group. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Uh, you know, your last remark, we had a discussion two hours ago about whether 
concepts of peace building and state building create misleading frameworks for analysis and for action. Uh, and both of you have sort of said, in effect, that this whole crisis was predictable but not preventable, um, which brings us to the role of the United Nations and UNMIS in the field and uh, Margaret Carey and her colleagues here in New York, of course, are struggling with these issues. So, uh, Margaret, why, why don't you sort of share Thanks, your John. insights with us, please? Thanks, John. And, and me to, to be here today and, and Ambassador Den and, and my colleague, Professor Jock, for their, their statements. Um, I, I'm going to, as always, when I come to things like this, I speak as Meg Carey and not as a UN official, so I'm not speaking on behalf necessarily of, of the organization. But I would like to focus on, on UNMIS and, um, and a little bit from, a, from our perspective, from the peacekeeping perspective of how we got to where we are and, and what we need to, to go in the future. Um, and. You know, there was, as you know, and, and many of you were there, uh, great euphoria um, at the independence of South Sudan. And I think, you know, definitely from what we know from here, a misled perception in the parts of us who sit in, 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 in New York uh, or in capitals uh, that this was all going to go well. And that misperception led to a mandate which, as I recall, was some eight pages long and um, was all about peace building. It was, it was mixing somehow a peacekeeping operation with a peace building um, uh, support. Um, and there is a subject for a good PhD thesis for anybody about whether that's viable. Because in peacekeeping, when you're under Chapter 7 to protect, you need to maintain a impartiality but in state building, you're supporting a government to build a state. And is that possible under one mandate? I think that's something that we can take a look at. But nevertheless, when we started out on this experiment, um, uh, there was this great euphoria. And everybody thought we were going to go forward as partners with the government of Sudan and the international community towards building the state. Um, but that soon, um, uh, for no fault of, of our own, in our ivory towers uh, uh, was tripped. And that was tripped, first of all, by the conflict between Sudan and South Sudan. And when the oil was turned off for, for so many months and the, the uh, revenue dropped and the focus was on the border and on the conflict, uh, the peace building aspects of this, of this um, mission, I would, I would argue, didn't really have a partner, the partner that it needed. Uh, to do the SSR and the DDR and the, and, and the judicial build and the justice building and the rule of law building uh, that we were mandated to do. So we, we were tripped from, from the very beginning. Uh, from the very beginning also, we had a massive crisis in Jungle, as you'll recall, um, over Christmas time uh, that first year, uh, which led to a lot of violence, a lot of displacement, a lot of questioning also about UNMIS's ability uh, to protect. Uh, we were not fully fully deployed at that time, uh, but there was also questions there about our partner in South Sudan because they were not out there um, at the front either. Um, and and but what my lesson from that was not so much those tough days of the conflict, but what came after, and the the work that we tried to do with the government about coming up to a reconciliation process, extension of state authority, rule of law in those areas, I think never really got off the ground the way it, it should have. Um, these two major events then, I think, had a major impact on whether we could actually do the support to state building uh, that we needed to do. Um, um, but in, in any case, I think you, as, as Ambassador Deng pointed out, uh, you had a, a, a period of time 
of increasing tensions within the government itself, within the ruling party, the SPLM itself, which led finally to the cabinet reshuffle last summer. And I think anybody who, who was going to be, uh, who needed to be woken up should have been woken up last summer uh, because people uh, with names like Riek Mishar and Dengalor and Pagan Amun, I mean, I think we all knew that they were not going to just go silently into a, into a political opposition. The space wasn't there for that, and I think we knew that wasn't going to happen. But there were other tales, I mean, other signs, I think, also, which pointed it out, and it was very, very slow, if any, progress on the constitutional review progress. There were real concerns about human rights and political rights, uh, including the rights of, of the media. Uh, so you had a, a growing uh, political tensions and at the same time growing antagonism between uh, the government and, and, and the mission. Um, the antagonism didn't just come from uh, the fact that we were bringing people into our bases or the fact that uh, there was um, allegations that the mission was one-sided or the other. Um, it, it came much before that. Um, and you know, just to note that this mission uh, this mission where we thought we were going to have this great partnership has more and had more at the outbreak of this conflict, SOFA violations, than any other peacekeeping mission out there. So, I mean, there are definite signs there of antagonism and of difficulties between the mission, which was pushing for its freedom of movement, uh, the protection of its own uh, personnel, and we did have one PNG, the attempt of another, and we've had several staff that have had to leave. Uh, during the course of the current conflict, there were definitely those tensions there between the mission and the government and doing its protection and its human rights mandate. So there were signs, um, uh, both between the mission and, and the government, but also the internal um, uh, uh, issues within the government. And the peace building aspects of the mission never really, really took off uh, for various reasons. Um, I agree with, with what my colleagues have said that, you know, what happened on the 15th and 16th was not between Riek Mishar and Salva Kiir. This was a much broader um, expression of frustration uh, with, as, as you, I would agree, said, is the peace dividend um, and the marginalization and the, and the participate, participation in politics not really being there. The UN response, I think, though, um, you know, while maybe politically, um, it, it, it hasn't been able to do everything uh, to solve the problem that we would want to. I remember as a desk officer uh, back in 1994 when I watched our troops leave Rwanda, and this time I supported uh, an increase in uh, uh, troops going into South Sudan. So I think that at least uh, there is a, a lessons learned, and as Ambassador Den said, from each conflict you learn and you learn not what to do. And this was definitely something uh, that the Secretary General was very, very clear about. He was not going to watch his troops leave South Sudan. He was, in fact, going to increase, increase that support. Um, where do we go from here? And there I have more questions than I do answers for a, for a mission like on this. Because you're in a situation of, of continued conflict. I think the ICRC calls this or labels this a non-international armed conflict. What does that mean for the United Nations vis-a-vis -vis our, our, our posture uh, with either side? Those are questions that we're, we're, we're discussing. Um, I think it is very clear, and I, and I agree with you, um, about the peace process. Uh, for me, this is not a process that EGAD is launching that can be uh, uh, finalized in, in a couple of weeks. That would be, that would be wrong. The, the underlying causes and, the, um, and the, the issues out there are just too broad and too deep to think that you can have a sustainable uh, peace in, in, in a couple of weeks. I agree on the uh, cessation of hostilities and the sequencing is, is important. Um, but the cessation of hostilities itself is difficult. They signed that agreement, as I recall, on the 23rd of January, and neither side has kept to it at all. 
Uh, there's continued fighting on the ground. They don't even pretend to keep to it. There's continued fighting on the ground. We have signs of continued military buildup. You have a complication of, of the government of Uganda uh, supporting one side, not just in a defense, but in an offensive manner. Uh, you have some, some signs that there could be other means of support from uh, actors uh, to various sides. So you have a, a real threat of a regionalization. And I don't think it's a threat. I think it's a fact when you have refugees spilling over from one side or the other. The region is, is deeply, deeply concerned about where this is going. Um, so the problem with the international community is the international community looks for quick fixes and then goes to the next conflict. And I think what we have to learn from our experience is that we cannot allow a quick fix on, on this conflict. It's not going to be a quick fix. It's going to be, it's going to be a long-term fix. Um, and even the cessation of hostilities, it's not happening. And you know, one thing that many of us thought when that was signed is if you may have a certain command within elements of the SPLA that report uh, to, to government that are pro-government forces. But in the, on the other side, you have uh, various groups, I, I would argue, that have come together that are not necessarily under a single command and control. And when you have a cessation of hostilities, uh, getting any kind of command within that cessation of hostilities is going to be very difficult. So um, that, that does happen to have to happen first. We do have to stop the killing or help the parties stop the killing. We do need to make sure that there's humanitarian access. We do need to protect, but that is not simple in itself. And then the sequencing and the, the time that the international community needs to allow for the people of South Sudan to come to a system of governance which is sustainable. Um, what the end state of that is going to be, um, I don't think any of us know yet, but I think many of us would agree. An inclusive process looking at the very many layers of conflict, uh, issues of accountability, issues of reconciliation all need to be part of it. Um, where is UNMIS now and where is UNMIS going? Those are good questions which I cannot answer. Um, but there's several aspects uh, uh, for UNMIS. The Secretary General has, has told the Security Council and directed the mission to focus on protection, to focus on human rights, and to focus on support to humanitarian assistance. The, that is where the mission's focus is now. That requires impartiality. And then the question is, is how do you do that and how do you achieve that impartiality within a framework of support to government? Um, those are some of the key issues that we're looking at. And I know for humanitarian colleagues, um, and there may be many humanitarians in the room, they're deeply concerned about, about UNMIS's uh, uh, mandate to support government, which could be considered one side of, of a conflict or not, um, when, when um, they need impartiality themselves. And I'm very glad to hear what you said about, about Operation Lifeline Sudan and giving the independence uh, to, to the humanitarians to be able to, to direct assistance where, where it's needed and not, not under uh, the direction of one side or the other. Um, I think that from what we've also seen just on the way forward is why we need to, to try to get a cessation of hostilities in place, why we need to support a longer term peace process. Um, you're going to have a protection problem in South Sudan from, from indications that is going to last for a long time. Uh, when we look at uh, not only the IDPs uh, in our own bases, which is really unprecedented for a peacekeeping operation and presents all sorts of difficulties, but when we look at that and we look at the, the hundreds of thousands of IDPs out there, um, uh, they tell us they are not going back. They're not going back because they still have fear. And that fear will not be, be alleviated until there's a real, a real peace process. So they are not going to be in their homes for some time to come. And they don't have homes to go to anyway. The level of destruction is, is, is as said, is, is very high. Uh, there is no real uh, security force that they can rely on. So they're going to have an issue of IDPs, of refugees, of a protection with the coming rains, which will make most of the areas that these IDPs are in uh, really unlivable. Uh, where uh, you have major humanitarian problems. Um, there have been uh, talk of possible famine, uh, planting seasons not being um, uh, fulfilled, and so you're going to have huge humanitarian problems for the time, for the, for the, for the time to come. 
so I think the way the way I see it uh, proceeding is is you have a, a UN really focusing on those protection on those human rights issues uh, politically through our special envoy and with EGAD and through the council focusing on that cessation on that monitoring system to the cessation hopefully focusing on on a peace process that leads to a sustainable peace and then revisiting the whole experiment of unmiss thereafter, looking at some of the good suggestions that you made um, and others, and see where the where the Security Council wants to wants what it wants to do with this this experiment called unmiss and this this tool of peace and security, uh, where we can come together. I would say one thing in closing that wherever we go in the future, this has to be a collective response, a collective response of EGAD, of the African Union, of the United Nations as institutions, but also with the international community. It has to come together as a, as a as speaking with one voice and a real collective response towards um, the, the state building issues, but also um, and towards the, the nation building issues. Thank you. Well, Margaret, thank you very much. Actually, the three discussions taken together paint quite a picture here, and it seems to me to sort of compress it, there is at the same time the question, the problematic question of how to have an inclusive peace process, the various suggestions that Dr. Jock and actually Ambassador Deng have put forward, and then Margaret's remarks on the United Nations having or needing to have what I would call an incremental learning process. In other words, there's not just a straight line going from Rwanda to South Sudan and CAR, but there are all these jagged moments of experience and analysis. And in a way, the points that all three of you have made, that there's absolutely no quick fix, and that this is a long-term engagement, and then there's the question of whether the Council and EGAD and the AU are up to a long-term engagement given everything else that's happening, Mali, CAR, and so on. There's not to speak of the Middle East and all these other issues that are, are way out there. So there's a sort of multiple challenges as I kind of hear what has been said here. Uh, so I'd like to invite a few of you to ask a question or a comment. If you could stand up, we're webcasting this, and state your name and your organization or your affiliation. And uh, we'll take two or three, and then uh, maybe four, and then go back to the panel. So if any of you have anything you would like to ask, this is your moment. There's a lot of unmissed colleagues here. <laughs> Jeffrey. And, and then the gentleman in the back who just stood up. Right. And then the lady in the second row. So that'll be oh, the three. On call, just to get things started, right? Jeff Laurenti. Um, I wonder if you could walk through with us what was the degree of grassroots mobilization, political mobilization for the referendum that seems almost immediately after to have vaporized and disappeared. Uh, that is, uh, there was obviously some investment in politically mobilizing people in the villages and the countryside to get such a, an astonishing turnout for the referendum and appears to have disappeared since. And particularly, uh, Dr. York, what is the civil society of which you speak in South Sudan today? What are the, the ingredients of a kind of civil society that might mobilize somebody? Is there anybody to mobilize? And Ms. Carey and uh, Ambassador Deng, um, is this problem more manageable to the extent that you don't see much doubt in the Security Council or much conflict among the permanent members, among the, the major outside powers. This is this primarily to the extent there's outside interference, neighbors rather than more distant, nefarious great powers. Terrific. The gentleman in the back there, could you identify yourself, please? Yes, my name is Mauricio Paz Merino with the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights here in New York and former UNMIS uh, staff. Uh, this is a question for Ambassador Deng. If you could perhaps uh, tell me, ironically, we've seen that with this crisis, they, there's been a, some sort of a rapprochement with Sudan. And perhaps if you can tell me what is the state of situation right now in uh, and what the government is thinking about, how can they seize this opportunity perhaps to advance other issues with Sudan and how is the ABA situation going to, to also be affected? Thank you. Or is there another imminent crisis in Sudan as one of my colleagues this morning suggested might be on the horizon. 
if you could address that too, Francis. So the lady in the second row, please. Hello, my name is Blaine Setepani. I'm a high school student at Stony Brook, and I have a two-parted question. Um, how is civil society to be included when mediations have um, a distrust of, social, of civil society? And my second part of the question is, if not President Keir or Dr. McGar, is there a person who can be a national moral leader? Fantastic. So is anybody else one more before we go back to the panel? This gentleman in the fourth row, and then we'll come back to all of you all capturing the questions, I mm -hmm. trust. Thank you. Um, my name's Richard Bennett. Um, I was uh, uh, formerly with uh, UNMIS's uh, uh, working in human rights and uh, with OHCHR. And my question, I think, is, is mainly for Dr. Jock. Uh, but uh, I'd also invite the other members to respond. And I was, I was very interested in your distinction between state building and nation building, and your uh, comment that the international community had missed the boat a little bit um, on, on that. And I'd find it, uh, you, I think you also referred to the SBLA as lacking a shared culture or ethos. and. Uh, I thought that perhaps that linked in, not just for the SBLA, but for the citizenry as, as a whole. And I wondered whether you might be able to elaborate a little on that, in particular picking up what kinds of programs um, would you have in mind that the international community should support? And perhaps also linking it to your uh, point about the need for a a staged, a sequential peace process or peace agreement. And do you think that, that a peace agreement, although sequential, ought also to be comprehensive? And how far out should that look into these nation building issues that involve, as other people have said, the civil society? Thank you. All very, very good questions. So uh, can we go back? You want to start, Francis, please? We're, we'll stay in the order that we've been in for the moment. Uh, very quickly, uh, Jeffrey, the issue of mobilization for the referendum. Um, you know, I think Southern Sudanese were so eager to free themselves uh, that mobilization was not difficult. But I don't think it was a mobilization for objectives uh, beyond the exercise of uh, the right of the referendum with a view to independence. So I, 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 I have no way of knowing whether the method that was used then could be applied for other objectives than the one of uh, a referendum and independence. Um, there's a question about civil society, which I will leave to joke, although I know that uh, uh, recently, they had a meeting in, in uh, Nairobi uh, representing a wide variety of uh, civil society and very, very forceful in stating their case for being represented uh, at, the, uh, at the talks and coming up with some very creative ideas uh, that go beyond the pure uh, arrangement between the two warring factions. Um, the issue of, of Sudan, and it's, uh, that's a dimension which I think needs to be looked at more carefully because as we know, and as was pointed out earlier, uh, shortly after independence, a combination of problems with the Sudan and internal problems continue to manifest themselves. And frankly, that was the one that should not have uh, surprised anybody. Uh, I remember going with the Secretary General to Juba during the independence uh, celebrations, and, and I distinctly remember feeling ambivalent. On the one hand, Southerners, South Sudanese had achieved an objective for which they had struggled for so long. On the other hand, people who had allied with them in the Blue Nile and Southern Kordofan uh, were left uh, uh, with their problems not entirely resolved, except for a vague reference to consultations. And so it was very clear to me that unless we had a comprehensive settlement of problems within Sudan and within South Sudan, it would be very difficult to achieve
peace between the two countries and therefore within those countries as well. What we don't know now is whether these developments are entirely internal or there are other elements outside South Sudan. And of course, if you go back to the history of uh, the militias in the area, which frankly are the, uh, the remnants or even the roots of the present rebellions, and as we said earlier, these militias were absorbed, but not were rather uh, absorbed into the army without being integrated. And they maintain their loyalties and allegiance to their, uh, their previous commanders. So uh, there has been an improvement in the relations between Juba and Khartoum. But even in that coming together, there are elements that have also contributed to the conflict uh, with the formation of a cabinet, which many saw as uh, more, uh, you know, sort of friendly towards uh, Khartoum, and Khartoum openly welcomed it. And so I think the process of improving relations should be encouraged to continue, but has to be comprehensive in dealing with the problems in both countries in order to improve the climate between the two countries comprehensively. Uh, is there anyone else than Kir and Riak who could assume the mantle of leadership? Well, you know, again, uh, President Kir was, was elected popularly, very, I mean, he won overwhelming vote. And so one of the arguments now we have is, on the one hand, you have uh, rebels uh, who, to me, as long as you connect the process of the conflict leading to the ex eruption of violence and moving on to a rebellion, seeing the whole thing as a whole, uh, to me, the question of was it a coup, was it not a coup, uh, becomes almost secondary because obviously the thing together, we know what it is. That's the part that is uh, clearly challenging the government with a view to overthrowing Salva Kiir, an elected leader. There you have a person who, whose legitimacy is asserted because he was elected. It becomes very difficult to... Uh, to reconcile the two, because if Riyad Mashar were to succeed today, militarily, I don't think the world would welcome a uh, takeover by force of a government. And uh, at the same time, there are people who feel that uh, Salva Kiir was elected as a legitimate leader. What his challenge to do, though, is to continue to do what he had been doing, and that is to project a commitment to the unity of the country and to show that tendency of forgiveness and be accommodating of diversity in such a way that, uh, as Jok said, they all see the country as uh, one tribe. I mean, constructive management of diversity is a challenge that South Sudan faces. It is different from when you had a country which was defined by one ethnic group as an Arab and Muslim country, when you had many who were not Arabs and many who were not Muslims. But in the South, everybody's a minority. Nobody can claim to give the nation its identity or the identity of its group. I think those were the questions that were pertinent to me. <laughs> so, uh, Dr. Okay, thank you. On, on, I think Ambassador Deng is completely right that um, mobilization for the referendum was actually a mobilization around uh, what you didn't want rather than around what you people are. Right? So it was about what South Sudanese did not want to be, and that is to remain in the unity with Sudan. So it was easy because of the memory of the 50 years, some people will say 192 years of war, uh, or confrontation with the North. Of course, when you have all of that back in the backdrop, it's, no, it's a no-brainer that South Sudanese would rally around the cause to become independent. So they, 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 they knew what they didn't want, but uh, the question needed to be asked thereafter. So who are we now that we have become independent? What is it that a South Sudanese can point to and say, this is what symbolizes my attachment to the entity called South Sudan? Uh, what is the glue that Keep South, uh, make South Sudanese citizens of one nation? That is a serious question that needed to be asked, and, and that relates to the, to the question on, 
on on programs of social cohesion and uh, uh, clearly nations are made they are not born and if 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 south sudan was to become a cohesive nation uh, some basic things needed to be done uh, one of these uh, are the institutions uh, if the institutions are uh, diverse and representative of the ethnic makeup of the country, then people will be more likely to relate to the institutions rather than to their families or their regions or their ethnic groups. Other more active things that can be done are include the celebration of that diversity on a national stage uh, through uh, a kind of a conciliatory uh, memorial memorialization of the treacherous past. Everybody has contributed to the independence of South Sudan that needed to be memorialized in a way that everybody sees themselves as a contributor to that journey to nationhood. Uh, you, you needed to uh, have some work done on, on languages, some work done on uh, war memorials, uh, but not memorials that are done in a more static style of Northern European statues. Uh, but uh, more active, more performative memorials where you have a park uh, for people to celebrate and to perform, to sing, to tell a story about what has happened to them. Uh, in that sense, everybody will see themselves represented in the body politics. Um, uh, other programs include even the creation of institutions like the National Archives, the National Museum, the cultural centers, the war memorials, all of this would have been symbols around which people can rally because they see themselves uh, represented in it. Because basically the break away from, South, from Sudan was, was, uh, was, was, was really hinged on the complaint that, that South Sudanese cultures were being relegated to the realm of the unimportant on the Sudanese national stage, in the media and in the institutions and in languages and so forth, South Sudan was being marginalized on a cultural basis in a deeply racially divided society. And so when you became independent, you needed to do a program that moves away from that. And that was not uh, efficiently done. Um, uh, civil society used to be a very, very strong element in the politics of South Sudan during the war because we were all in the business of civil society because basically, it was a critique of the Sudanese state. So nobody could disagree that you wanted to criticize the Sudanese state for the violence, for the exclusion, for all of these things. But uh, when the CPA was signed and the government of Southern Sudan was formed, as it was called back then, 2005, everybody joined government en masse, making civil society, leaving it gutted of its leadership, of its ideas, of its capacity. Even ability to absorb donor money was lost. Uh, and so now it is beginning to rebuild itself, and it has now found a, a rallying point in the current crisis. Uh, as Ambassador Deng was saying, I was in Nairobi when we started uh, the South Sudan Civil Society uh, Crisis Response uh, Team. Uh, and we, we all sat around these ideas that the next peace agreement has got to be something far better than just uh, the usual business of the warring parties sitting in a room and dividing things among themselves and we go back home. That is not going to happen because that is simply deferring conflict and, and eruption of violence the way it did. And we should not allow that to happen again. And so civil society is beginning to assert itself uh, more directly by pressing upon the mediators. It's not even, because the, 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 the warring parties will deny the, the, the need for civil society. They will, they will say, ah, what do we need them for? Um, but the mediators need to make the point to the, to the parties that in order for this peace process to be meaningful and to be a, uh, something that looks towards the future, you have to involve them in terms of agenda, in terms of the programs, but also in terms of the diversity of representation of the, of the South Sudanese people. Uh, that, uh, that, that the sequential uh, peace process will definitely uh, be a, a long one, I would say. Uh, it needs patience, it needs honesty, it needs clear commitment from the mediators um, in order for the parties to, to have the stamina to keep it up before somebody thinks that they have a more military advantage and they don't need the peace agreement, they can go and win the war, uh, which is impossible. Nobody, nobody wins wars in South Sudan. I think uh, the, the degree to which somebody will be genuinely interested in peace talks 
is depending on how much power they think they have to maintain a, uh, an ongoing war or how little power they have in order to, to sign a quicker peace agreement. I think on the issue of Kir versus uh, uh, Riyak, I would say, obviously, Riyak is not going to be a president of the Nuer. And Salva Kir has also increasingly now lost a lot of uh, credibility in, in the eyes of a lot of citizens. He may be an elected president, but I think uh, I, I'm, going to, I'm going to wish for something that is impossible more so in Africa, and that is President Kiri should, um, should, 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 should plan to resign. I think if President Kiri says today, what has happened, I did not do it, but it was done under my watch, and I'm sorry for it. Now I'm going to be a statesman and put South Sudan ahead of my own interest. Resign in about a, a year and a half. In the meantime, plan for uh, several steps, the constitution to be done, the elections to be, be, be carried out. For him, he will go out gracefully and will be a statesman for, uh, for life instead of being trying to be president for life. Okay, thanks. Um, I talked to three questions. The first is on the Security Council, and I think uh, one person asked about uh, the divisions within the council on South Sudan, does it make it any easier or not? I mean, you don't, you, you, of course, you don't see the divisions in the Security Council around South Sudan that you see on other questions facing, facing the council. But I think what, what is, 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 is uh, the issue for the Security Council is, is what is the same on our minds right now in the Secretariat, is, is what is unmiss in this context? And what is this context? Is this a civil war? Is it a rebellious movement? Where is the peace process going? Uh, how, do you, how do you do state building in this context? Do you not do it? Do you focus on these issues or not? These are the questions that we have and that the council has. So it's not, they're, they're not necessarily politically divided one against the, one in one grouping against another grouping as it is about where does UNMIS go as a peace building, peacekeeping mission in the context that it, there is now where there's been a fundamental shift on the ground from what was assumed when, when that mandate was established um, uh, uh, two years ago. And so that, that's the issue for the council and for all of us right now. Um, on the question of ABA, will it be affected? It has been affected. There's no doubt, it has been affected. Has Sudan been affected? It has been affected. I think that, that everybody welcomed uh, President uh, Bashir uh, coming to Juba uh, uh, announcing that he was not going to get in involved on, or his government would get involved on one side or another. But that border and the border agreements and the border monitoring and the ABA question and the continued negotiations between Sudan and South Sudan, it's all on hold. And so all of the progress we had been working towards there um, is, is on hold. Now, the, if this, if this uh, uh, conflict is prolonged, I don't think there's any doubt, but that you will see problems along that border, and that will affect. And you know, to to just respond to to John's question about Sudan uh, being the next, I think that you know, um, the 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 talks between uh, Khartoum and and uh, South Kordofan and the Blue Nile um, have been ongoing for the past several days. Uh, there has been uh, initiatives towards um, um, dialogue, national dialogue around a constitutional review process. Um, the, the government has welcomed the uh, various uh, uh, rebel groups as a part of that process. So you see some opportunities, but then you and but you also see some some real concerns, and that it, one of them is about the possibility of Jem having had played a role on behalf of the government in, in some of the fighting in, in South Sudan. You see, you see the, the, the Darfur rebel group's relationship with Khartoum and how that'll offend, and Khartoum's relationship, and I mean Khartoum, the, the uh, Kampala, and, and you see uh, Uganda in South Sudan, the prolongation of that, and the relationship between Khartoum and Kampala. So that's what you talk about, a complexity of regional uh, problems, but I would not say in, in my, um, uh, knowledge of, of the political situation in Sudan that uh, Sudan is, 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 is at fear of going the same way of South Sudan in the near future. There is some elements there of hope. Thanks. I think Ambassador Deng wanted to come in again. Well, just to, uh, to moderate the level of agreement uh, among the panelists. <laughs> <laughs>
Jog, of course, has every right to make a suggestion as to <laughs> what should be done. But I think we should recall that uh, President Salva Kiir has been challenging not only other leaders, but specifically also Riyadh Mashar, that if he wants the leadership, all he needs to do is wait for the next elections. And the elections are only uh, soon, uh, uh, this year, in uh, 2014, 15? 15. 15. 15. Now, the other thing, though, uh, and I remember telling President Salva Kiir when I was still on the other side of the UN, uh, that there are two aspects of our people's culture which uh, are both positive and negative. One is that it's such an egalitarian society where everybody feels he's as good as anybody to be a leader. And every family is as good as any other family. That is the democratic spirit. That's good. But it makes it difficult to govern because everybody thinks, why not me? Why you? So I think if it should be a question of free competition for elections, we won't run short of people who would aspire to become presidents. So um, we're going to wrap this up at 2.45 sharp, which is about a dozen minutes from now. So uh, if anybody here would like to ask another question, we're going to do that, and the panel can think of their concluding remarks uh, once we come back from the questions here. So we're going to have three questions here, the gentleman here and the two ladies on the aisle. And please identify yourself in a short question. My name is uh, David Bassiuni, the former UN UNICEF official and the former Minister of Agriculture of South Sudan in the 70s. So, um, because I come from South Sudan, I'm familiar with most of what uh, our speakers have presented. But I come to these events with a very specific purpose. I come to look for uh, the silver linings. What are the nuggets? What are the things? Because take tsunami. After tsunami in Thailand or Cambodia, the poor farmers go back to their villages to dig you know, the nuggets, the small things that can make them restart life. And so I'm looking for that. And I'm saying within what has happened, which is devastating, we are all sad about it. We denounce it. What are some of the positive things that are happening or are happening within South Sudan, in our societies, in our organizations, which might be of use to us? Very good. I, very, sorry. very short question. One it, question. Uh, no, I don't have questions. I, right, we, we've, got to, we've got to wrap I'm up. Just as well leave, but I wanted to pause three. Uh, comments which will be of use to you. Very, very short. Okay. We've, got, we've got to end at okay. quarter to three, and I want these two okay. ladies to speak. Uh, rather than, yeah, well, I, I'll give three examples of what I think is positive. One, the Politburo meeting, which occurred in December, many people blame it as the trigger for the crisis. I look at that as a very positive democratic process, because it's the first time people really, South Sudanese, are discussing their differences. Number two, you look at all the political parties in South Sudan. They are all SPLM. SPLM DC, SPLM proper, SPLM detainees, SPLM uh, uh, opposition. So there is something in this party. Is there something, a framework, within which we can really build a larger tent of really, uh, of, of, of uh, diversity in the party. Number three, and let me go to peacekeeping and directly to ANMIS. ANMIS was blamed in the past for failing to protect civilians. In this particular instance, ANMIS was a great lifesaver for many, many, many civilians. So the question is, how did how did ANMI succeed? Can we build on that? Very good. And thank, thank, and, and thank finally, you. And finally, finally. No, 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 no please. Chairman. Thank you very much. The lady in the second row here, really, thank you. Should I talk really fast? <laughs> um, Felicia Gordon, uh, Peace Building Support Office, formerly of <laughs> UNMIS, very recently. Um, very quickly, I'm looking a little bit forward. 
and this is a question for you both, um, if I may. How do you see now, in uh, view of this crisis, how does the transition, the political transition period now go? Um, if you know, to the extent you know, both from the civil society perspective and from the perspective of the government. Um, and also within that, there is, if I remember correctly, I think it was even today, that the parliament passed uh, a supplementary budget um, for South Sudan, and that budget um, doesn't include an amount for um, reconstruction. Is there any kind of plans or thoughts on how, given the devastation that the ministers have talked about and others, are there some plans for reconstruction? Do you know how might you go about that and who might you call upon to help with that? Thank you. Terrific. And the lady two rows behind you. Hello, Justine Fleischner, uh, formerly of the Small Arms Survey and soon to be technical advisor to the DDR Commission. And my question is, what is the alternative to buying stability in South Sudan? What do we do with all of the militias moving forward? And particularly, how do we address grievances um, of the newer community, particularly now that they've been captured by a narrative that they are excluded and marginalized from the political process? Thank you. Terrific. So we're going to have you please just answer as you feel comfortable these points, and these are your concluding remarks. Uh, Francis, we'll, we'll stay in the order we've been in. Okay. Well, uh, I, I was prepared to give my time to David to, to develop more of uh, the positive side out of all this mess. Uh, Rather than answer the questions uh, that have just been posed, and I'll leave for my colleagues to, to give answers, let me make a, a kind of embracing comment. Uh, we have been saying that South Sudan fought for, as I say, over half a century for certain principles. Uh, the fighting discrimination, fighting for equality, for justice, for dignity, for all. And we always thought that these were really the foundations of building the South to correct uh, what we objected to in the previous government. I still think that uh, if there is proper conscious raising to identify the kind of challenges that made people fight for so long as providing a basis for building society, even the whole notion of exclusion the challenge of managing diversity constructively, positively, the question of respect for human rights, liberties, the issue of making peace dividends available to the ordinary person, the issue of making use of the vast resources that the country has to the benefit of the people themselves. These are concrete things for which we could easily win partnership. There was recently a conference of donors in, in Juba which from everything we hear was quite enthusiastically endorsed by many investors. And I get calls from people now saying, what does this mean for now for the prospects of investment? Well, the resources are still there. And even the people, when you come to think of many African countries that became independent, they did not have the kind of resource, the human resources that South Sudan now has. Uh, thanks perhaps to education being acquired during uh, the, uh, the war. It's a question of redirecting them to be much more relevant to the needs of, of the country. And so I would, one last point. I don't know the extent to which we have made good use of our traditional leaders. Uh, the British ruled that vast country with a relatively small number of people, but they used what they call indirect rule that is building on tribal identities led by their tribal leaders who every year, from my own memory, would all meet to discuss how their tribes should work together, live together. Customary law was what governed most people. Now we have disempowered most of these people and we depend on these few so-called uh, government officials to maintain peace and security throughout the country. I think we could go back to some of that as a positive aspect of our society. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so um, there are definitely pockets of positive things 
uh, going on. I can list uh, a couple of those. Uh, one is that South Sudan is not a Dinka or Nuer country alone. It's, it's, uh, the Dinka and the Nuer make, uh, make up something like 57% of the country. In this conflict, you have, we have not heard what the Zande have said, what the Moro have said, what all these other groups have said. And that could be something that the Dinka and the Nuer, both of them can learn from the Equatorians, that South Sudan is more important than, I mean, what is it that you get as a, as, as a Dinka, even if you are given your, your own uh, entity to rule? It, is, it doesn't amount to much. Um, and so I think perhaps we can, t we can uh, going forward, uh, including the question on, on, on the political processes going forward, I think it is time to try other th systems of governance. Uh, the Ethiopians have toyed with the idea of ethnic federalism. It has not solved every problem, but it has solved a lot of problems. Perhaps it is time that South Sudanese enter a, a, a debate on whether that should be tried in South Sudan, ethnic federalism. Because many of these ethnic groups are contiguous. I mean, they, they, they Dinka live in seven states, but they are kind of next to each other in all of the seven states. So they could form um, some sort of uh, one or two federal states. The, the Nuer can also be put in a one or two states and so forth. I think they, this can be positive. Um, people also helped each other during the mayhem of the last two months. There have been Nuer people who have protected the Dinka people. There are now a lot of Nuer people displaced from Western Upper Nile into Warab and lakes, and they are protected. Uh, so it, is, it, is, it, it does not begin to look ethnic when you go to the, re, to the everyday lives. Uh, you see that there are many historic relations to call upon, intermarriages, um, uh, friendships, peace agreements that have been, uh, been reached in the past, all of these things co continue to maintain a semblance of, of cohesion that can be built upon. Um, but uh, lastly, I think uh, the, the business of rebuilding uh, social cohesion after many, many decades of violence, a society that is weighed down by a treacherous history of a quest for independent nationhood uh, is, a, is a burden on, 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 on the society and it's, it has not begun to be offloaded. And I think uh, when people voted for independence or fought for independence all these years, they used to sweep under the rug all of the differences that they, that they went through, even violent episodes where the Dinka may have fought with, against the Nuer, the Toposo in Eastern Equatoria may have fought the Dinka and so forth. But they were all eventually patched up in the interest of keeping everybody's eyes on the prize. Which is, the prize was the independence of South Sudan with the hope that when independence came, that people will go back and say, look, we did all these horrible things to one another in the interest of achieving our, our independence. Now it is time we chart a different, a different path. And that different path can only come for, through recognition of wrongs that have been done and some sense of uh, recompense uh, achieved. That will uh, reforge relationships between different ethnic groups. And I think that is something that uh, needed to be, need to be invested in. And so uh, if, if Animus was going to help proje projects of nation building, I think uh, uh, focusing on this horizontal uh, peacemaking is very, very important as opposed to focusing only on a vertical state building. Thank you. Thanks. So just in closing, uh, I'd like to say a couple of things. The first is um, negative. Um, I think there is a real risk of things getting worse on the ground, and there is a real risk of the regionalization uh, becoming more pronounced. And a high level of attention from the African Union, EGAD, uh, and, the, and the Security Council is required, but more importantly, uh, the high-level attention to those risks needs to be taken uh, by the protagonist to this conflict um, if it's not going to, to get worse and, and have uh, real uh, deeper effects on the people of South Sudan, but also on its, on its neighbors. On a more positive note, I pick up what some of my colleagues have said, and I agree that there are opportunities in crisis. Um, I think that looking at what has gone wrong uh, looking at um, um, the, the history, the 50 years of war, the, the deep issues of, of, of reconciliation, 
the, 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 the problems of the past couple of years in terms of, of governance, the need for open, more open, more transparent government, uh, uh, for, for social services and peace dividends to get down to the very grassroots, uh, to deal with issues of inclusiveness and dealing with issues of marginalization. These, these are the issues which fundamentally brought this crisis to a head, the frustration, the, the missed opportunities. And these are the issues that can, that can take the foundation of a peace process. And there I would plead, after 23 years of peacekeeping, to the international community to take the time and pay the attention to make sure that this is not a quick peace and wipe your hands and go to the next thing. This is not a peace that's going to be resolved in elections. This is a peace that can only be resolved in a, in a prolonged dialogue and towards a, a, a process of, of, of national reconciliation. Um, UNMISS, what about UNMISS, the peacekeeping operation? Uh, the, the issues before us that I, I stated earlier and before the council seems to be a debate between impartiality required for protection and human rights versus its state building mandate that it, that it received. Can you do one uh, while you're doing the other? Can you do one in a, conflict, in a, in a situation of conflict? Uh, there I would also say that it's, 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 much, it's not so simple. A more nuanced approach is required, and, and deep thought is required. But, but nonetheless, UNMIS does need to pull itself back from the state building and focus over the next months on the protection and on the human rights. And that is going to take a certain level of impartiality, and that is going to be prolonged tensions with the, with, with the government. Um, I'd, I'd just like to also state about, about these um, uh, theories uh, that UNMIS has, or that people within Mon UNMIS has supported one side or the other. I, d I don't believe that is the case, and I'm not saying that because of I'm the director uh, who deals with this this mission. Um, when you're when you're in a in a situation of impartiality, uh, where you have to treat both sides equally, both sides are going to hate you, or both sides are going to be against you because they don't see you only on their side. And so actually having so much criticism towards a peacekeeping operation may show that maybe it is trying to walk that fine line, uh, which it's had to walk uh, more and more um, in, in, in the past months. Uh, so I think it's going to continue to be very tough for UNMIS. I think it's going to continue to be a very tough situation on the ground as we move into the rains and beyond. Um, but it is only um, actually going to begin to get better if, as I think most of the, the all of the panelists uh, here said, um, if the international community and the people of S South Sudan allow for a, a real and uh, peace process dealing with with the very deep level of issues uh, that brought us to this crisis. Thank you. Well, this has been a very thoughtful and reflective discussion, and the three of you have brought a tremendous amount of experience to these ideas and recommendations. To end up on an upbeat note, you mentioned the constructive management of diversity is a big challenge for South Sudan. And everybody who's now not South Sudanese who's in this room comes from another country. And I would argue that every country uh, on the globe uh, has had to deal with the constructive management of diversity, to use your phrase, including the United States. Uh, so this is not a struggle that's absolutely unique to South Sudan. And all you have to think about is race relations, the long history of that in our country, in the United States, as well as challenges in Europe and elsewhere. So I want to, uh, on behalf of everybody here, thank Ambassador Deng, Dr. Jock, and Margaret Carey for really very wonderful presentations. And we wish the best to the people of South Sudan. So let's give them all a big hand.